Hello, Mario. Really good to have you. Today, we're talking about uh, early stage investments and really lucky to have you here as my favorite early stage investor from Emerge Education. Maybe you want to start off with a, a few words about yourself, but then also uh, the early days at Emerge and how you dive into investment in general. Of course. Thank you, Thomas. Pleasure to be here. Happy to start uh, with my background and a few sentences on Emerge. So on a high level, I started my career in strategy consulting that moved into impact investing and really wanted to focus my career on a industry I was the most passionate about. Um, so my story going way back is um, originally from Bosnia when I was 17, got very lucky to win a series of scholarships that helped me move to the US and, and study at Harvard, uh, changed my life and career, career trajectory. So I became very aware of how fortunate I was and how much luck I had to be able to convert you know, hard work into, into results. And throughout my career, I realized how many people there were in the world that just didn't have that luck and those opportunities. So built up my interest in education technology, workforce technology as a, as a sector where I believe there was a ton of potential for technology really to enable everyone to fulfill their potential. Seven years ago, I met my two partners who were at the time running Emerge. A quick history of Emerge was we started as the, as the first investor in Europe focused on education technology back in 2014. At the time, we ran an accelerator and, um, and an angel syndicate in parallel that would invest in the companies that, that we would find. And um, those, were the, those were the early origins in terms of the markets. You know, US, China were picking up when it came to ed tech. No one was looking at Europe. Nothing was happening. So we're really passionate about kickstarting the space through, through, investments, um, through investments in Europe. And um, throughout that experience, it, it led us on to raising our first institutional fund and, and now investing out of our second institutional fund, which is a 50 million fund investing in pre-seed and seed stage businesses in the education technology workforce development sectors. Really inspiring already. Let's touch a bit on your topic of passion because you said education um, is, is a topic of passion for you. And at the same time, now it's also investing into ad techs, into entrepreneurs that really change the landscape of education. But how did you realize that this is really the field, the topic that you want to get into? Did, was that a feeling that grew within you? How did it all start? Like, why, why an investor? You could have started the university too, or you could have uh, started your yeah. own ad tech too. Yeah. So why this combination of the two fields? It's a great question. Um, for, me, for me, career discovery, I actually ran a process with my wife at the time when we were both at, at specific periods in our career where we... we didn't really know what to do next. And for me, thinking about career was thinking about from a functional skills perspective, what I was good at and where I can contribute the most to the world. And from a passionate passion perspective on what gets me up in the morning and, and really motivates me. I think I reached a stage where, you know, there were many opportunities in perhaps at the time more lucrative sectors financially, like private equity, uh, as an example, but realize that, you know, I'm the person, I'm the type of person that just kind of cannot motivate myself to do things I don't believe in. At the time, I realized I was good and uh, in finance, I, I like doing finance, I like working with numbers, I like understanding markets, I like thinking about tough decisions and, and where to allocate capital. You know, given my story, I was just extremely passionate about the potential businesses can have in, in getting more Marios from Bosnia and other parts of the world to, to, you know, get to top universities, to top jobs and help them fulfill their potential. So I was really, you know, deeply reflecting on my skills and passions and, and finding the, the, the perfect, uh, the perfect combination um, and why, you know, investing versus entrepreneurship versus running university, I guess, you know, on other parts of my persona has always been, you know, g getting a, a bird's eye view of, of the market and, and getting, you know, variety mm -hmm. and exposure to working with, you know, tons of amazing founders and companies. So at the time and still, that was a great area of interest for me versus, you know, just doubling down on, on one specific thing. I, I, I liked the opportunity to have exposure to 
you know dozens and then hundreds of um, you know companies and and individuals in the space. That's definitely something really great to have that holistic bird's eye view where you can even have a passion for more topics than just one, right? Uh, which is very, very different angles when it comes to education. Diving a little deeper because you said you did a little of, uh, a lot of introspection and more or less talking a lot about your, your own skills with your wife. Yeah. Um, thinking of your own childhood and your own education, to, to what extent did that influence who you are today? It played... Um played a big role um so you know coming from from bosnia which was a war-torn country in the in the 90s i you know saw a lot of you know poverty in, in inequality and you know a lot of people working really hard to to get out of that situation and and earn a better life and you know i saw a lot of people that you know didn't have the luck i had to really fulfill that potential that they, they had through the hard work so It was a big inspiration for me in terms of thinking about the sector and what I do and, and helping others. Um, but also from a you know, family perspective, I come from a family of, of educators. One of my grandfathers was a piano professor. Another grandfather was a, was a school teacher. Grandmother worked for children with special educational needs. Mom was an English teacher. Father was a guitar teacher. So pretty much everyone, now that I counted up, was a teacher of some uh -huh. type. Um, so I was surrounded by teachers, and especially my grandfather played a key role in you know, helping me build study habits, revisions, memorizing things for school, and, and really embedded the, the, you know, the habits I needed in the And the motivation and the passion I needed at the time to to enjoy studying. So you know, education on that front on that front was always a key thing that surrounded me and definitely you know played a role in inspiring me for my career. Speaking of the the many teachers in your life, do you or did you have role models early on? Do you still have role models now? Were you like, wow, this is an investor that that really inspires me? Or is there no such thing where you say yeah. there's one specific? person that you look up to and want to learn from yeah it's a great question um personally i've never been you know a person that has had idols or, or role models uh, from a career perspective obviously you know i had them from a music perspective growing up as a kid you know you had your favorite bands um from a career perspective i i'd say i'd had you know inspirations that played key roles in in my career from a you know role model perspective You know, I like to read from from everyone. I think everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, and everyone, you know, there are so many people that do amazing things. So I've never quite had that. You know, you're my person, but I've I've had that approach more like, hey, there are 50 amazing people. What can I learn from each one of them? Um, in terms of, you know, inspirations and and mentors I've had, you know, in the earlier days there were probably two. So one was um, an amazing woman, Marina, that I met when I was a teenager in Bosnia who really inspired me to think big and advised me on education in the U.S. and different opportunities, different scholarships, and she became my host mom in the U.S., so I consider her playing a huge role in motivating me and opening my eyes towards what was possible with my life. And then probably while I was in university, I took a class on social entrepreneurship, uh, Professor David Ager that I had that ran the most exciting, amazing class on really opening my eyes to, you know, the potential to do business for good. Um, and I remember reading How to Change the World. I think this was Bill Drayton, founder of Ashoka, which, which played a huge role in just inspiring me and, you know, thinking about the world through that lens rather than just kind of making money. So um, nice. those are the things that highlight. Many people actually inspired you and let you become who you are. But uh, it's also interesting to hear that for you, a university experience in one university course let you to dive deeper into a specific field. Um, you spoke about doing business for good or social entrepreneurship, which actually lets us move into a very interesting next field, which is the topic of mission-driven entrepreneurs that actually change the world, that have an impact. And Emerge is a fund that... Uh, not only primarily, but I would say exclusively invests uh, with a thought of impact. But let us understand your personal note. What's success and impact for you personally and what really makes a successful venture um, for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And 
I must admit, uh, you know, if you're asking me from a personal perspective, I think that's something that's always evolving in terms of really trying to quantify and understand what is my personal contribution to the world. I'd say more from a qualitative perspective, I like to see what I do, what we do to be net additional to the world of, of education. So rather than just kind of being another investor that chips into a company's fundraising round, more more so being a instrumental investor that really plays that zero to one role in the company's um, development. That's what excites all of us. We think there's still a huge shortage of capital for young early stage businesses. And that's where we can really move the needle in terms of that, you know, zero to one, you know, making sure that once we're done with our, our work at the end of our careers, we, we really contributed to something that would not have existed otherwise. From a qualitative perspective, that's how I see it. From a mission perspective, from my work and 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 our funds work, you know, the democratizing access to opportunity statement is very much what ties us and and assuring that mm -hmm. in always possible the businesses we are backing are creating a more equal world with more opportunity where everyone, regardless of who, where they're born to, can with the right affordable education that's accessible and impactful fulfill their potential. So that's how we think of it from a you know top down perspective. And underneath that we have you know, various metrics we track in terms of the, the reach of the business, the efficacy of the business and, and other pillars that, you know, we, we ask our portfolio companies to, to report on, on a, on a, on an annual basis. So again, in summary, it's the, you know, it's the importance of what they're doing. It's the inclusivity of, of the end users. It's the reach and it's the evidence base to, to back what they're doing. Um, so that's how we operationalize things from a mission tracking and then you know fundamentally from a financial perspective we are a you know fund that invests because we deeply believe in the financial side of the equation as well as the impact side of the equation so you know your typical back of the envelope venture capital expectation um, especially investing at this early stages you know believing in businesses that can through various business models, achieve a you know 100 million revenue annual run rate as a you know as as the target you know in you know seven to ten years from you know us first investing in them. So that means for you, impact investing definitely goes hand in hand with the financial part of it, right? Um, that the company has the potential to to grow, scale globally, and to reach millions, uh, if not billions, of people, right? So, but it's not something exclusive. So you wouldn't say it's either or. Um, it needs to go hand in hand, right? Yeah, I, I think there are different definitions of impact investing. There's a there's a spectrum there, right? Um, on one side, you've got having been in the impact investing, more impact first space previously, um, you've got a spectrum where there are certain institutions usually attached to foundations that used to do grant investments and uh, have transitioned more in an investing role where their expectations could be that actually they're happy to lose money on this investment as long as specific financial, as, as specific impact goals are met given that It's a very difficult, you know, target population and a very difficult business to run if you're looking for, you know, a financial profit. So you have that on one side of the spectrum. In between, you've got impact investors that appreciate that they want to make money on the investments, but that the the return in exchange for the impact they're making is likely to be below market returns if you look at the you know S&P 500 and if you look at the benchmark for you know for profit first investors so there's a category in there that acknowledges there's a trade off and then there's a category on the on the other side of the spectrum which is all about you know not compromising on on either of those metrics so hitting financial goals and hitting impact goals so you know we see ourselves in that bucket but you know there's a there's a spectrum here in terms of you know how you think about how you define impact investing.
maybe one one more question on that topic because it's so exciting is that something that you see growing or that you could observe growing in the past years this very specific term but then also the the subsegment of uh, of venture capital or angel investments towards impact or is that something that's always been there or is this more or less uh, yeah a really growing and strongly growing field yeah Again, I think it's you know how you define impact. I would I would definitely say overall yes. I think when I started in uh, in, in my previous company more than a decade ago, impact investing was quite a, a niche term that everyone was trying to wrap their head around. I think now it's a uh, it's a lot more recognized. And previously, for-profit investors would just run away from the label because they didn't want to be associated with with charity, which is at the time perhaps a connotation of impact investing. But now you have you know, a lot of large financial institutions that lean into it and and um, and embrace it. So definitely think it's a it's a it's a bigger space. I think what remains a challenge always is is the definitions of what that exactly means i think some people apply blanket policies to specific sectors that everything is impact some people are much more rigorous in terms of impact meaning reaching specific populations that are towards the bottom of the pyramid um, so i think that that remains and will continue to be a you know discussion topic and it's always important to have the right definitions and tools to clarify you know who thinks what when they think about impact investing. Cool. Let, let's move a bit to the the humans and the people and the team you invest into. I, I can share that uh, we found you, Estimar University, as our early stage investor through, uh, I still would say, one of the most brilliant series of articles that you personally wrote <laughs> on Challenger Universities. And I'm still waiting for the way, um, by the way, to the for the next episode of it. Um, but that was that was something that really inspired me and Christian, where you thought deeply, but then also spoke a lot about uh, challenger universities and why Christian and I reached out to you was because it seemed you really had a clear conviction and a mission with what you're doing with the fund. To what extent are you looking for the same in entrepreneurs? So what's the what's the thing you're um, looking for when you want to invest into entrepreneurs? Is that prior experience? Is it a strong mission drivenness? Is it the business model? Is it the market? So what makes an outstanding team plus entrepreneur for you? On, on a high level, as you said, from a, from a market perspective, we are a sector specialist fund that lives and breathes education and, and workforce development and you know in most cases are very proactive in terms of the having knowledge well in advance to understand what types of businesses we want to back given how many people we speak to and how many end users we speak to every day to appreciate and understand their problems. Um, from a from a Founder perspective, yes, we are a uh, very operations focused funds in terms of structures and processes that we have to create standardized processes and you know fair comparisons between businesses when we make investment decisions. So against your question, we have currently four dimensions we look at when we are invest, uh, evaluating specifically the the teams. Um, number one is, understanding the drive and motivation as you mentioned earlier you know, really believing in the genuine motivation why this person is doing what they're doing is a huge role i believe in in making a decision to to invest for us and i i believe for for many other funds it's just necessary given the time horizons and the difficulties of entrepreneurship if you are backing a founder that came across an idea because it was cool it's hard to see a situation where the business is about to go bankrupt it's tough and the founder persisting for another five years to achieve their goals whereas if you're you know, backing missionary founders that can deeply tie why they're doing to their stories and their personal interests you know those types of businesses in our opinion are more more resilient to the to the tough times in in entrepreneurship um so that's the number one thing we look at and we believe this sector of ours attracts many mission-driven founders like yourself and Christian that 
we just, you know, love working with and, you know, are excited for every meeting we have, even we feel like we're in the same, you know, you know, career missions and journeys. In the background to that, of course, there, there are other criteria. The, the second one we think of is, is unfair advantage. So this is very much in the skill set perspective. Does the team demonstrate in their previous careers they have the right skills to achieve um, the the mission of the of the business? And you know this includes you know previous operating experience, market knowledge, openness to to listen to to feedback and and learn, but also more importantly learning agility. We've you know we back teams that don't have the experience on their on their CVs, but we think are just learning machines and and can very quickly acquire the knowledge and fill in the gaps through through hiring. So that's number two. And then number three is, is very much the execution side of things. Again, we've invested early, so there's not much data. So it, it is it is going into minute details of, of understanding distance traveled uh, from you know day to day and week to week when we speak. Do we feel like this team has momentum? Can they can they move fast? with very little resources. Mm. Um, what we were amazed by you guys at Tomorrow University was meeting a team with a idea and you genuinely got us believing that you can launch a university in the first year and you did. And, you know, we, we judged that based on every time we spoke, you guys were making significant process on a dimension that could have taken a, another company two months, you were doing it in two days. So just the, you know, the velocity of execution, the productivity um, is, 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 is key in this space. And you know, really the, the depth of knowledge and vicinity to the end user in terms of understanding their problems as well. And then lastly, it's you know, the dimension of leadership. Um, do we believe this is a, not just a great founding team, but a team that can find more people like themselves, manage those people, leads, communicate effectively, fundraise, and have clear strategic clarity in terms of, you know, how to navigate difficult situations and how to take the business from the next level in the many pivotal moments the company is going to have. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Those are the you know four key pillars we look at to, to value the team. Super inspiring. Forwarding to the next topic, let's let's uh, let's assume you you made that decision based on the four dimensions whom to invest in. How, how does that then work from the moment that you have decided to invest in it? Is there a clear mission that you follow with every investment where you say this is how we help these people? Um, this is how we contribute? Because the way I experience it for you, it's not here's the money and please leave me alone. Yeah. You're a really active investor, but based on which principles which which ideas do you actually yeah do you, do you build that collaboration with the founding team so as you say we we're very hands-on funds that believes they really have a lot of knowledge and and, and, a, and a network that can really move the needle for the founders and, and be you know very net additional in their journeys the you know fundamental part of our DNA is our venture partner group so we have 100 plus venture partners with our funds who are individuals that have founded, led, and managed some of the, the largest businesses in education technology and workforce development. These individuals invest in our funds and they work with us because they are excited about supporting the, the next generation of founders in the, in the industry. So that's how we started back in the days. And, you know, that's really how over the years we have built out our DNA and, you know, we have amazing coverage of, you know, the biggest businesses in ed tech, founders of these companies, functional skills, market knowledge, uh, whatever we need as a founder. So every business we're investing in throughout that due diligence journey, we have at least 10, 15 of our venture partners to look at the deal with us, both to help us validate the, the, the market potential and the founders uh, and identify, you know, the gaps in knowledge of the founders. And then on the back end to help us identify that once we do invest, what is that select group of venture partners that could really closely work with the companies uh, alongside us. So each one of our companies has full access to all of our venture partners when they need them on a specific basis. We have a you know very detailed codified database of you know on, on how everyone can help. Um, and you know fundamentally core part of our working with founders is you know, getting to work with one of us uh, very closely, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis, and getting to work with our venture partners as well. 
I mean, I, I can definitely confirm um, that uh, m many of the, the things you did after investing into us led to where we are today. Really, really strong active support, meaning from or ranging from uh, yeah, international contacts to introductions. I think that's, that's what smart investing is about. It's not only about the money or actually the money is not the core part of it, but what, what lies behind is the people. For um, sure. We talked a bit about the beauty of uh, investments and we talked about the things that you look up for when it comes to entrepreneurs, but what about the dark sides of an investor? Um, <laughs> is there a dark side? I mean, uh, it's, it's beautiful to, to work with mission driven founders to, yeah, democratize the access to edu education, but are there dark sides uh, either for you personally or in general? Many people in general think of investing as this wonderful career where you can just sit back and enjoy and get founders chasing you and dying, you know, dying to take your money and where you can just easily pick the ones you want to work with and, and everything goes well. I think in reality is there are so many elements to venture capital that make this uh, a job that requires a lot of strong multitasking skills and, and context switching skills where in a given day, I'm probably switching six contexts in six hours. Either I'm, a, I'm a judging someone, I'm helping someone, I'm pitching someone, I'm evaluating someone, or I'm empathizing with someone. So uh, that context switching, you know, can be quite challenging um, in terms of, you know, ne needing to play different roles in, in, in different times. And from an investment perspective, you know, it's an incredibly tough job where you're seeing, you know, thousand businesses and, you know, you need to back, you know, one or two businesses out of those thousands, you know, that tends to be the, the, the funnels where we're looking at. So, you know, every day, unfortunately, you're telling a lot of people you don't want to back them because that's just how the model works. You know, you know, the average venture capital fund is making 20, 30 investments over a three to four year period. So there's a lot of tough decisions and, you know, saying no is to a lot of great people. Uh, so I think that's a, that's definitely a, a challenging part. And then there's always the part in venture capital where you're backing founders and the, the feedback loops are, are very long, right? So mm -hmm. you track, follow on investing, you track financial metrics, but then as we, as we know, you know, you can become a unicorn, but if you don't have the right fundamentals, it, it's still not going to work out. Right. So I think, totally. you know, constantly reevaluating yourself and understanding the decisions you've made and whether they've been the right ones, given how long the, the feedback cycles are, I think can, you know, be stressful to a lot of people, people in the industry. And then lastly, it's, you know, of course, you know, a lot of funds have a reputation of not adding value, but, you know, if you're, if you're on the board of the businesses, it's a, it's a tough job, you know, in terms of, you know, being resourceful and, you know, constantly being there for the companies in, in the tough times and, you know, figuring out what to do when, you know, companies running out of money, when a company needs a key introduction there. So obviously empathizing, going on those journeys with, with founders through the, you know, the tough times can also obviously be, you know, highly stressful. That's a beautiful, beautiful topic. Let me dig in a little bit. Understanding more about you and making you a thriving uh, individual at that fund. Do you have any secrets to share? Like any habits that you grew over time, for example, to manage the multitasking or context shifting? What is it that, that you personally do for learning and becoming even more successful than you are right now? I think, um, you know, in terms of how we manage our work, we're much see ourselves running a company rather than just a just a fund so we we have a quarterly cycle where we plan all of our missions as a team with individual responsibilities in terms of who is doing what this quarter and what we're committing to doing from the the more standard actions around meeting ex founders facilitating ex investments specific support around portfolio companies to you know missions that move the needle forward for the for the company, creating new assets, updating the website, creating new processes, pitch decks, et cetera. We're, we're quite disciplined on, on that perspective to kind of you know, run the business on, on a quarterly basis. So we always have the you know, check and challenge around, are we setting the right objectives and, and priorities for ourselves? And you know, underneath that, we, we run an agile 
process, which which is on a monthly basis, where we you know commit to the top tasks we're looking to do, and you know those are the top tasks that really should be done. And if the other things don't happen, they don't happen. But we try to stay focused on you know the highest um, ROI opportunities. So you know, that's a core part in terms of how we operate, which you know you know helps with the habits and the and the routines, and of course you know having very frequent, you know, personal development sessions, you know, on a weekly basis, you know, I'd say, you know, bi-weekly basis, perhaps on average, everyone on the team gets to share feedback with each other in terms of, you know, how can we learn? How can we better? I'm a big believer in learning from work and learning in the flow of work. Of course, a lot of my learning is reading about industries, reading about what funds are doing, following newsletters, understanding the fundamentals of, of, of finance uh, that happens, but if you've got the right processes as a as a company, I'm a big believer in the you know daily, uh, the seventy twenty ten framework that you know a huge part of your learning comes from every conversation you have. If you are able to reflect on it and and integrate you know the learnings from each conversation in your um, in your day to day work. Thanks for sharing. I have two two remaining questions. Putting myself in the shoes of wanting to become an investor and seeking your advice, what would be good steps to actually embark on that journey. Uh, yeah. I have the mission to uh, to do the same as you do uh, because you're inspiring me. What would I need to do? Baby steps, but then maybe also on a bigger scale. Yeah. In general, venture capital is a relatively small market. You know, it's, it's, it's a sizable you know, industry from a amount of money that's invested, but most funds are still run by you know, relatively small teams when we're talking single digits. So, by nature, it's a hard industry to get into. I'd say, you know, if I think about key traits that are, you know, favorable for you to have a good start in in venture capital, I think, you know, analytical thinking is a is a super important one in terms of, you know, are you able to quickly go through a lot of noise, filter, and identify what the key companies are to look at and also what the key levers are for each business to understand their potential that's number one number two is you know strong social skills we're in the business of networking uh, building relationships and you know persuading each other with every founder we work with that you know we're the right partner and they're the right partner for us to, to spend the next decades and plus uh, working together and then i'd say you know, number three is you know probably the entrepreneurial mindset. So being able to deal with a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity, being proactive at times where you might not know what you're doing. It's we're not working big corporates where you have this you know daily micromanagement as a, as a junior person. You you need to figure things out yourself. You need to run your own initiatives. You need to be proactive and creative. And then you know fourth is you know running and managing processes you know finance is very much process driven so you know being able to reliably create those processes alignment processes and then stick the processes you know that that is a you know big trait of you know the most successful funds that can you know reliably every fund vintage continue producing great um, great results so you know if you have those traits you, you have a great starting point if you don't you know it's figuring out how can you develop those traits in your careers before uh, venture capital and then you know if you think about um specifically how to get into venture capital there's the obviously looking for funds you like following their job boards and understanding when they're hiring uh, a second uh, you know important angle is you know networking you'll be doing networking in the job so showing that you can network before the job going to relevant events going to places getting introductions to your network um, to people that might be your future employers is a great start. And then third um, is probably building a portfolio and exhibiting behaviors that clearly show that even before you apply to the job, you are extremely passionate about the job. So if you're applying to a, a place like Emerge and you spend the last year and a half publishing articles on LinkedIn about your passion and the future of education technology, it, 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 you know, it'll set you wow. apart in terms of you having shown that uh, previously. Um, so, you know, doing as much as you can on that front, you know, can be helpful as well. 
Well, that sounded like we, we could even build a whole curriculum on what you just shared uh, <laughs> on the different traits that you could educate yourself for when wanting to become an investor. Mario, maybe one last advice, putting myself in the shoes more of um, a change maker in gen general, that may mean that uh, I want to start a business or simply change an organization, start a movement. Uh, you've seen so many entrepreneurs, you've seen so many people that are actually changing the world, um, mm. either on a small scale or on a bigger scale. But what's that one single advice that you would give to anyone out there wanting to create a better tomorrow, wanting to really do something meaningful? What's that one thing that you would say, this is really what moves the, moves the needle? I know it's a hard question because it's, it's always many things that do. But if you were to pin it down to that one single thing, what's the advice that you would li like to leave the audience with? Yeah, if I may bundle two little things together, I'd say <laughs> think, okay. think carefully about what you want to do and how closely it aligns to your missions and values and and how much you believe in the problem, I think is a prerequisite. And then you know, my main advice is just do it. The main reason why most people don't succeed and most people aren't entrepreneurs is because they, they're they afraid to take that leap. They're afraid to take risks. They're afraid of, of failures. And in my life, you know, being naive sometimes and and being brave enough to apply to a university I never thought I could get into was, you know, the best thing I'd ever done. So um, I'd say, you know, that's the key, key trait that separates, you know, some of the best entrepreneurs to the rest of the field, willing to do something, being okay with being embarrassed, being okay with, with being wrong, because everyone is emb gets embarrassed at some stage, everyone's wrong at some times. But if you, if you really find the right idea, and if you really find the right path, that's the only way you can you know, really change the world. So having the courage to actually change the world and then uh, that certain action orientation of simply doing it. Love it. Thank you very much, Mario, for sharing your wisdom and your expertise on investing, but then also on you personally and how you came to where you are. I personally found that incredibly valuable and insightful. Curious to see where that leads you even further. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch nevertheless. Uh, but thanks for sharing all your thoughts and experiences on Changemaker Insights. Thanks, Mario. My pleasure. Thanks, Thomas.